key aware. Well, um, a good day to everybody. For some people, it's a good evening, and for us, it's a, uh, good morning. Well, it is really a pleasure to introduce Professor John Raul. She's a very good friend of mine. I met her a long time ago in New York, and she was kind enough to invite me over there, which is quite, quite a miracle. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yes, I'm just getting the people uh, <clears throat> to get in, yes. Uh, this is okay. Well, as I was saying that, uh, no, it's not me. <laughs> okay, I think we are fine. Uh, well, in any case, uh, I said that uh, I met uh, Professor Rowley in, in New York at the City University in a very important college, which is America uh, Evers College. And uh, I was delighted over there. And since then, we have been, uh, we are very good friends and we have uh, collaborated in many uh, initiatives, uh, intellectual things, uh, articles, that kind of things, mainly in the field of uh, entrepreneurship, which is a leader and also in education in that area. It is, of course, a great pleasure uh, to have her with us. She belongs to the organizing committee. She's also the chief editor of section B of our electronic journal, uh, uh, Inglo Mayor, and so on. And I'm almost sure that uh, she will also uh, be supporting us. And. Uh, not just here, it's just uh, the family and so on. So, uh, Professor Roll, uh, you are more than welcome. I don't want to read the whole uh, CD you have because it's very long. I will need several sessions for to do so. But uh, people will understand uh, quickly uh, what you are doing. So, uh, thank you very much and you can start. If you like, please. Hello, Roberto, I'm here. Oh, hello. hello. Hello, my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See you. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're going to start. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I am just so pleased to be here. Uh, it's a Saturday morning. It's beautiful here in the New York, Washington, D.C. Uh, not, not Washington, D.C. Uh, my, my daughter and my, my granddaughter are there, so part of me is always there. But I am very pleased to be with you. And this is a small group. So, you know, I have lots of uh, 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 material to cover. But let me just tell you a little bit about the body of work first before I get started. I bring you greetings from Megar Evers College of the City University of New York, where our president, President Rudy Crew, and our provost, Provost Augustine Okariki, have been very supportive of the work that we do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about effective teaching and learning in the new world economy, but I want you to be aware that we work together as an interdisciplinary team. Uh, Professor Roberto, I, 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 I don't want to uh, 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 just embarrass him, but the very first time I met him as a PhD physicist, the presentation he gave was on happiness. And so I, I went through my mind, I said, a scientist talking about happiness, we've got to have more of this. And so really since 2015, 2016, we've, that's right, we've, we've been uh, working together with a, a cross international team. Professor Jacqueline Casato is out of uh, Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. She teaches at Kenyatta University. Her areas of expertise is in entrepreneurship and marketing and she has run the incubator center there. And she's published with us several papers. We worked on study abroad together. Uh, we've uh, uh, actually, right now, we're working on a book project together. Professor Michael Crump is new to Mega Evers College, but he's not new to entrepreneurship. He's a practitioner with academic credentials, holding a PhD in entrepreneurship. And he's led our team of student entrepreneurs. We have over 35 entrepreneurship 
businesses on, on campus, some of which are truly launched and businesses up and running, providing jobs for those students as well as their community. And you now you also know our dear Professor Roberto. He is he he is one of the fresh, refreshing pieces uh, in in our group. He comes to the work always positive. He comes to the work always giving and willing to contribute in discipline. Pro, uh, professor uh, 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 Reed. Uh, uh, Professor Alicia Reed is the chair of our chemistry and environmental science department, and she has done cross-disciplinary work with Professor Crump and Casato, and we too have also published together. Professor Price is a public administration uh, a faculty member. He contributes mostly in uh, the area of prison recidivism, but he also is a practicing entrepreneur and has published in that area as well. And then Nia Rock, she is our industry advisor. She is in the banking industry. Her area of focus is in community development. And I've taken the time in the very beginning of this presentation to let you know that it's the team and collaboration, and it's a team with different perspectives. Uh, and I'll just say this because I'm among friends, Professor Acevedo and myself, we are among the older end of this group. And then we have uh, the newer, uh, <laughs> you can laugh and I could call myself old, I'm not gonna call you old. <laughs> but we have many, many years of service as educators. My, my years of service as an education administrator is over 20 years. Uh, and, and, and I'm not gonna quote his, he, he has even more. So we're at the other end, but we're trying to bring young educators along so that they will help create the new generation of leaders that we need in this new economy. So I'm already five minutes in my pitch. I have my stopwatch going. I want you to know because I have a hard stop and I want to share with you as much information as I can. On this agenda, we're going to talk about why the need for transformation in education. In the beginning, before we started, uh, Professor uh, Acevedo was talking about jobs. What brought us to this work, and I'm talking about Megar Evers, was our president saw that even though we had great students, many of them weren't getting jobs. And we're in the heart of the financial district and fashion district in, uh, at least in the US. Uh, and so it was like, if they can't get jobs in corporations, how and what are we gonna do for the students we serve and the students we love? So part of, of the need came out of, we, we promised that we would help our students with their dream of upward mobility. And I'll talk a little bit more about disparity and inequality in income and wealth as we go along the pitch. We weren't, able to deliver. And so that is one of the reasons why we got into the work. But as we look at education across the broad spectrum of the globe, education itself is in the midst of a transformation and it is being disrupted by the pandemic. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I'll share with you some of the predictions that we looked at that were 10 years ago and they, and they talked about what education in 2020 was gonna be and some of them are spot on. Some of them have even been accelerated by the pandemic and I'll talk a little bit about that. I wanna talk a little bit about preparing for the new generation of, of students 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the students were very different, uh, you know, uh, in a lot of different ways. I don't have to tell you, you, you <clears throat> educators uh, uh, know that. And so we're, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how to prepare for that new generation of students, preparing students for the new economy. The world as we knew it has gone away. The economies are going to be grossly different and operating different. And how do we prepare our students for that difference? and inspiring a love of learning. I, I'm just gonna take a, a, a time out to say, I just uh, read a book, I re, I'm a ferocious reader. I just read a book and it was a business book. Although the title of the book was Love is Damn Good Business. Now, I don't read many book titles that have damn and love in it, but this one gave case study after case study how the love of your craft, the love of your business, the love of what you do can generate 
prosperity and abundance. So I wanna talk about the love of learning a little bit and developing ecosystems for a lifetime of learning and global collaborations as the world continues to change faster and faster. So let me get into the body of the work. I talk fast. You let me know if I need to slow down, I can. All right, so here is the real issue globally. Worldwide income disparities. Uh, and, and I'll net it out for you. The middle class is getting squeezed, but they're not getting squeezed by the bottom. They're getting squeezed by the top 1%. The top three richest men in the world now did not exist. Their companies were barely existing 40 years ago. Uh, the, the innovators, uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, all of that happened within our lifetime. And so we see a lot of income disparities. This morning I was reading that JP Morgan just committed millions of dollars to help hmm, not alleviate, but change some of the income disparities. Some understand that the way we are doing business now is not sustainable. It is not sustainable for so many to need so much and so few to have so much. So even though they recognize the problems, because lots of them are starting to find ways to uh, donate, give, et cetera, everyone is looking for a mechanism of how do we adjust globally some of the inequities that, that have come forward. And in 2018, some of the data became available where we can compare country by country, the inequities. And I will tell you, because I could talk about the US, the U.S., the prediction, if we go to 2050 without intervention, we are going to be worse than we are now. And let me just talk about Black-White differentials because I do a lot of work in that space, in the racial space. When we look at the data of income disparities between Blacks and whites in America, we had more equity, more assets, more uh, a, a, a more equitable situation in the civil rights movement than we do today. How could that happen? Because a lot of the wealth has been generated through business, through home ownership, all of which many minorities don't have access to. So the, the income disparities, these, this is data pre-pandemic. The evidence of the uh, pandemic is going to cause more, uh, 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 more income disparities. Many of the jobs, the low-end jobs, the retail jobs, the face-to-face -face service jobs, those jobs are going away. Some will come back, but many of those businesses won't come back, so many of those jobs won't come back. So our issue and why we study entrepreneurship, uh, why we want to create job creators instead of job seekers, we believe if you understand your community and you create uh, companies and businesses in your community, you will help create jobs in your community to help lift your community up. So how do we prepare for what we are calling the unscaled economy? This work is taken by uh, taken by uh, Hemet Tajit. Uh, he, he, he's an innovator, uh, one of those who is resident uh, in that space, and he, he's a, a futurist. Uh, can we say, but the technologies he was talking to are no longer te uh, in the labs. Uh, the, the, the technology that, that we're talking about, uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, 3D printing, augmented reality, those are all here in many of the businesses that are working. I'll just give you one example of artificial intelligence. We at Megar Elvis Colleges are working with a European firm that has AI in bookkeeping and accounting. And so the lower end repetitive uh, postings that a person would have done. The system is smart enough to do those. Now, do they need the upper end accountant? Yes, they need them for other kinds of functions, other knowledge workers, but the low end repeatable uh, 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 skill set is, is moving on. So how do we prepare for what industry is asking us for? How do we prepare the, uh, the, for leadership in the future? The, the, the young people who are coming behind us who are going to rule and run the world. Hopefully they'll do a better job than, than, than we did. But when we ask this question of many of the uh, uh, leaders who are leading now in these corporations, they came up in the, the very first uh, 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 a 
a criteria or what they're looking for is, <laughs> is leaders who can lead through com uh, complexity and ambiguity. Now, let me just peel back the onion on that. This was in 2019, prior to the real hit of the pandemic. But what about the next pandemic or the big crisis? What leaders will we have prepared to take on the complexity and the ambiguity? What they are saying is we don't know what's coming in the future, but whatever it is, we need someone who could adapt to that. They also said they need someone who can lead through influence, not just by command and control. In my day, you would give a, a, an employee an order and you would expect them to execute it. This workforce now, they wanna be involved, they wanna be engaged. And so you need to have the skill to influence as opposed to expect them to do it by uh, 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 command and control. The ability to uh, manage on a remote basis, they saw this coming already. Corporations are worldwide, are global. So you can be a leader in Chile uh, commanding a workforce in uh, uh, Australia or the US. And so they needed folks who could understand what it takes to lead someone they, they may never physically see. That not that daunting? I mean, in our time, we would never imagine uh, uh, being a manager or a leader of someone we've never met physically. And so, so more and more of that is coming because uh, the factors of production are, are becoming more fluid. The ability to manage a workforce with a combination of humans and machines. In the previous slide, I showed or shared with you about the, all kinds of technologies that, that are coming and some are still in the labs that we don't uh, know about. But what they're saying is we need, we need leaders who understand that humans are not going away and machines are not going away. So we need you to be able to work with it both. And then last, as we've seen in the pandemic, we need leaders who are able to, to, to turn around quickly, to understand and solve the problem or resolve the problem and put at least some solutions in place that address the problems. So those are what uh, the, the, the Deloitte study found when they looked at across the globe, what, uh, lead, what uh, managers and leaders in these corporations were saying. So let me talk about a prediction from the past. And this was a prediction uh, 10 years ago. And this is what they saw for 2020. So it was very, very forward thinking. Um, they saw that students will interact with others remotely. And we see now most of our students, they can't get to us. They can't get to each other. And so without even knowing the pandemic was coming, this forecast was that the students were gonna be more remote. The success of tech will still rely on skilled teachers. Our, our students are gonna need us more than ever before. The dynamics of a world that we have not seen, they will need the nurturing, they will need the mentoring, they will need the caring that we as educators can provide, even though we don't know what the technology will be. We'll think differently about diploma. I'm going to uh, not talk much about this. I'm going to share with you a real live MIT example where the student opted not to take the degree or certification, just took all the courses online and did all of the exams online because they wanted the skill and they wanted to perform the skill, whatever it was, either develop a business or an app, and they did not have time to wait for us, the academy, to take them through two or three years or whatever it would take. I said this, I did a presentation last night and I said to my colleagues who, who were all, all women, educators and institutions will be forced to adapt. If we don't adapt, and many won't adapt, many won't exist. We are starting to see some of this now. Many of the educational institutions were already in decline. As I spoke before, many of the retail industries were already in decline. And so the pandemic just put a, a made a graveyard of many institutions and some will be academic institutions as well. Uh, there will be some that just refuse to or won't be able to change. And so, and, and that is the impact of the pandemic. It has been a disruptor. I believe on the other side of it, it will be a transformation that will make us better. So let me talk a little bit about uh, preparing for the new, stu uh, the new generation of students. I will, I will say 
I, I will give you an, a personal example here of the challenges of students. My students, many of them come to us who are in college because they want better lives. They dream of a better life for themselves and their families. Many of them uh, of, are of Caribbean her heritage. Many of them are of African heritage. And many of them are of Latino heritage. That is the dem uh, demography uh, of our students. And so let's say when this pandemic began, uh, one, I mean, this is my example for you. One of the students uh, was living in a, a one room apartment with five or six uh, people. The job earner lost their job. Um, there was no way to pay rent. There was no way for food, all kinds of life challenges. This one student reached out to her faculty member and her faculty member reached out to me and we together uh, uh, worked with our institutions and other institutions to help that family because guess what if the student is worried about their daily living and eating it's going to be hard for them to actually be effective in your classroom and learning so what i'm saying here is we may have to step outside of our role as the sage on the stage and actually understand more about who that person is in front of us. And so, so, so uh, uh, the, the next bullet is being passionate about our teaching and learning craft. Most of us are passionate about our discipline. That's why we're in our discipline. My specific discipline is e uh, economics and entrepreneurship. But I also need to be passionate about what it takes for that student to learn. Now, I'm the dean of a business school and I can tell you because I could tell on some of my faculty. Uh, some of them have said, well, it's my job to teach is their job to learn. And I, I, I can share with you, the, uh, as I will in the uh, next fo following slides, students are having more and more choices. They're going to choose the environment that is going to be right for them. If they can't learn in your environment, they're going to be able to, uh, because of the dynamics of disruption, to go somewhere else in some other environment and be able to learn. So it's important to uh, not only to teach, but to try and help your student learn and create a safe and rigorous learning community. Again, I wanna talk about, there are some areas where, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what I, I know, where the girls feel um, uncomfortable in some of the STEM disciplines. Uh, and, and I've seen it and I, and, and I, and, and I know it say statistics in my, my area. And so uh, when, when I show you the, the uh, little short video clip of a student doing peer-to-peer -peer engagement, how another student or, a peer breaks it down so it could be easier to learn, the, the students are turning to each other for help as well. And the use of technology to engage students. We, most of us have, have, have gone into this online learning, but it's not just the, the, the lecture. When we engage in online learning, it is difficult for us to see the face of the student because now they could turn, or, or turn off their video as many of us do. And, and we, don't, we don't know if they're receiving. If they're in your classroom, you can tell if they're receiving. So we might have to do some things a little bit differently to engage engage them. Okay, uh, I'm going on to speed up a little bit. I encourage active and experiential learning. And here I'm going to give you an example of what we do in entrepreneurship. We did not, before we hired Professor Crump, have an actual class in entrepreneurship, but we had funding because those who funded us understood that if we could create job creators, that that would help the overall community. So what we did was we, we, we had real active learning and experiential learning kinds of activities for those students. We had a boot camp, which was one week of business training for any discipline. We had scientists in that boot camp. We had uh, 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 psychology majors in that boot camp. We had liberal arts folks in that boot camp. So having a business background wasn't the determinant, but the ability to at the end to to, to, to go through some of the tools that we use in business in general, you need to be able to look at some of the financial reports to actually run a business. You need to be able to do a pitch. So at the end of the week, those students who had went through that program, they were eligible 
for many of the study abroad uh, trips that we, we did. And we pay for it 100%. Uh, and for them to study how you do entrepreneurship in different countries. We went to Chile, we went to Jamaica, we went to Italy, we went to Kenya. We went to Kenya two or three times. And I'll tell you why we went to Kenya two or three times. Because when the students, our students, who looked like the students that was in Kenya, and they saw how hard they were working, and they saw the businesses that they were really running, they said to me, oh, Dean, the Kenyans are ahead of us. We got to up our game. I didn't have to say anything. They wanted to do more and they wanted to learn more and it was outside of the classroom. So active and they learn by doing. So active and experiential learning is important that we, that we do. And staying current in the field of, of, of study. Our field is dynamic in uh, economics and entrepreneurship. It continues to change because we get changes from the industry. So it is important to stay, uh, uh, stay current in the field. And uh, I, I just want to give you uh, two examples here. Our, uh, one of our mentors and our colleagues, Roger Kaufman, we worked together with him. We met, uh, I've known Roger for 15 or 20 years, but he came to that same conference where I met uh, Professor Acevano. And Roger had, had been retired ever since I knew, knew him. So that was not his driver. But Roger had, had written 41 books. And over to write even in retirement because his love and gift was a contribution to the work, the body of the work, not just the institution. And I can tell you, I've talked to Roberta several times saying, I don't know when we should retire or when I should retire. And he said, no, don't retire, don't stop, just keep going. So what I'm saying here is that the work is bigger than the institution. Continue to work, continue to study and involve your, your students in your research and scholarship, those students that went to Kenya, they did several case studies and came back and we wrote those case studies up and they presented them in the international conferences. We do, uh, we, we co-host uh, an international conference with our colleagues in the UK. And they, uh, the, one of the uh, students, uh, his name is Emil Morgan, presented so well and he's a, he was an undergraduate student that the, that, that the attendees in the conference were calling him professor. They thought he was a professor. And so my point here is when we show them and not just tell them how to research and give them encouragement and push them and work with them, uh, many great things can happen. So collaborating with the industry peers and, and officials is all important. I will give you specific examples as I go along. But this is the point where uh, I'm almost halfway in my presentation. And as I talked about looking at uh, other modes, I want to demonstrate it as well. We all know what the formal teaching and learning is. I'm not going to spend much time on that. But self-directed ultra learning is what I was talking about. This Scott Young, he, he actually published a book, but he did an experiment uh, with uh, MIT, computer science curriculum. He wanted the knowledge, whatever it was, to, to start his business or to uh, start doing an uh, app. And there's several uh, uh, examples he gives us in the book, not just his own example. And I'm going to share just a few minutes of this, let's see, it comes up. Hey guys, welcome back to week 32 of the MIT challenge, which is to learn MIT's four-year computer science curriculum in 12 months without taking any classes or even being enrolled at MIT. So today I want to talk about how do you learn something or how do you understand a subject when you start reading it or you start watching the lectures and you realize I do not get any of this. And although I've been doing these lectures and I've been talking about how optimistic I am about being able to learn a lot of the classes, this has actually happened to me quite a bit. And it often happens because when you're in school or when you're in a classroom, there's sort of the expectation that you're going to be given material that's at your level. So you feel that if you don't understand it, then it must be your fault. You must not be strong enough or must not know the material well enough to actually learn it. And this is a big problem because I think that the proper way to think about things is that if you're struggling with math or you're struggling with calculus, for example, 
it's not because you're dumb. It's not because you're not a math person. It's not because you have some intrinsic quality that you're lacking, but rather just because you're missing the first steps. And so some of the other students have some of those first conceptual steps put in place and you don't. And so all you need to do is put in those conceptual steps, put in that groundwork, and then the subject will be just as easy for you, or maybe not just as easy, but close to as easy for you as it is for the best students. And so to explain this right now, I'm doing a class 6.013, which is. Okay, so that's an example of peer to peer engagement. That entire clip of how to make a, a difficult course easier is seven minutes. Uh, your, our lectures are 45 minutes, an hour or so, but in a seven minute clip, he demystifies a difficult course. Most of my students, in fact, uh, I will say at Megger, the highest rate of failure in a course is in the mathematics, uh, followed by uh, uh, English. And so what he's sharing with uh, anyone, and he has uh, hundreds of thousands of views on that, is a way to decompose a way to decompose the, uh, the, uh, the, the difficulty that folks find, students find with a course. And math is one, I don't know if you have it as an issue in your institution, but we continuously have it as an issue in ours. And so the next uh, one that I'm going to talk to you about is industry collaborations. And here, many of the industries and many of the corporations know what's coming in the future because they heavily invest. And so it behooves us to do collaborations with them. I will give you one that we are doing with IBM. Uh, and when I say we, I mean the City University of New York. IBM wants more computer science and computer information systems ready uh, workforce. And so City University of New York is one of the largest when we look at all our institutions. And so they are working with our faculty, looking at the curriculum and how the curriculum needs to be adjusted. And so that is one collaboration I'll talk to you about. But the one that I am most proud of is the one that we are working with with the state of New York. So we have a public-private partnership. We have the government, we have the private sector, uh, and we have the institution, uh, uh, Mega Evers uh, College. Uh, the, 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 the Startup New York program, uh, they, the, the, the state of New York invested millions of dollars in tax relief to startup firms that will work with ac uh, academic institutions to bring more jobs into the economy. So everybody's concerned about the number of jobs. And so I'd say maybe four years years ago, we started with the Startup New York program and we had several, and it's a long arduous process to get in because the, the tax relief is not just state tax relief for the corporation, but it's tax relief for every employee in the firm, which is significant. So uh, uh, we, we've had several, but the most uh, successful one that we've had is the one with Nanotronics. And what Nanotronics did uh, and let me just talk about the CEO. And this is leadership by example and where leadership makes a difference. The CEO said, we don't just want to take the tax relief. We want to be an integral part of what you're doing and how to help you um, uh, 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 create and find jobs and, and help with your, with your student preparations. They have come into our classrooms. They have delivered uh, 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 talks. They have worked with our faculty one-on-one. -on -one. They have worked with our career center. But just maybe six weeks ago, the CEO himself did a keynote address at our international uh, conference. And what he said was it's important to let the students be curious. It is important to allow them to find their passions, to let them explore. Now, Nanotronics is, was a small firm, but I will tell you, in the state of New York, they are number one for being job creators. They are now, we are operating out of Brooklyn um, uh, Navy Yard, and they are literally building buildings to house the new employees because they have that much uh, uh, demand for uh, labor that's coming through. Okay. I talked a little bit about love and the context of the craft, but I, I, so I just want to continue with this and I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse, but our students understand when we care 
and they can see that. And a lot of times the abstracts make sense to us. Uh, I, I, was, I was in a, a, a faculty meeting yesterday and the mathematician was talking about the difference between uh, abstract because I quite candidly asked them, you know, mathematics is in science and tech, technology. I quite uh, asked them, I said, how can we improve the pass rate of mathematics? That's where I, the students can't even get to the school of business unless they pass the mathematics and the English. So I uh, point blank asked them. And what he said was, we need more theory and real world application so that the students can see why the math is important and how it relates. And we can take that to any discipline. If we can connect the theory to the real world applications, the students will understand and will care and be able to perform more. Uh, and instruction be, should be student centric. You know, um, I, I, I'm not gonna uh, sh uh, share a whole lot uh, here. All I will say is I've seen a lot of in in, uh, instances where the students are not the center of, uh, of, of, of teaching and learning and they should be because the students are a reason for being, you know, and their learning is our reason for being. And I, I, I say this all the time, many of the students are still looking for their passion and, and we need to encourage them because if they become passionate about your subject, I've seen this with my own eyes and my own teaching. In fact, in my very early career, when I was teaching entrepreneurship, I would work with them to search and find what it was they cared about or what they was interested in. Because once you find that, your job is easier. You sit back and watch them just push themselves. But without that, they are, they're just trying to find a way to get an easy grade or to get a uh, to get out of school so they can get a job. But if they could find something that they could be passionate in, then they can prepare themselves to really make the contribution that they can't make for themselves, their community and the world. And I do believe, and maybe I'm still Pollyanna about this, individuals can change the world. Or if we can't change the world, we can each at least change the lives of the students we love and serve. And so love of learning as a skill I believe will become a lifetime benefit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, now. Uh, students must learn that, you know, many of us, my students would say, I can't wait till I graduate and, and that'll be it. They don't understand that that's the beginning of this journey. It's not the end of the journey. Uh, you know, my degree is several decades old, but if I stop learning, then I have less to add and less to contribute. So we must, we must kind of uh, 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 make them aware that you know the, the 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 academic process is dynamic. It, oh, it goes on. It doesn't end with a credential. It is just a starting gate for us to be able to make more contribution. Uh, um, oh, I went back instead of forward. Um, all right, so here it's important to talk about developing uh, ecosystems of a lifetime of learning and global collaborations. I started off taking the time to let you know the team that I work with consistently. Now, I work with others in India, I work with others in Pakistan and the UK, but that team I presented to you is my core group team that I work with. Um, and when I'm engaged in the work, I hope you can see my passion, when I'm engaged in the work, is because I truly believe the global wealth and income disparities is something we as a body, as humanity need to address because what we are doing now is just not sustainable. You know, I talked to Professor Acevano and he's preparing, I've even seen some of his dissertation students. He's preparing these PhDs and some of them, they wanna stay in country, they wanna work in Chile. And when they go out to the job market, many of them, and it's not just Chile, in the US, I have many of my colleagues, we tell them, get your terminal degree and things will be different and they can't find jobs. Most PhDs are looking for teaching jobs, but as we, as we see the world as it's changing, many of those opportunities are contracting instead of expanding. So, um, so, we, we, so, 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 so we need to explore options for increasing the utilization of global diverse talent. There are many women 
who are coming out credentialed and need experience. And because of the networks and the challenges, at least in the corporate environment, um, they are not finding them. You can look at most boardrooms. In most boardrooms who run most companies, those boardrooms are yet to be diverse. Hope for the future of technology and teaching innovations, this disruption. One thing I'm glad about the pandemic is it has forced us to say business as usual will not happen. Business as usual is a thing of the past. So we must change, we are changing. Unity in community and capacity building. I believe that the work that is being done in Chile in education and the work that's being done in Kenya in education and the work that's being done in Jamaica in education will help inform to improve the work that we are doing in Brooklyn in education. And so the, as we build communities together and make them stronger together, uh, we grow as a world uh, and improve better. And so I'm also gonna talk about a need for improve of global uh, listening. You know, as academicians and many in many other sectors, we talk a lot. We just simply talk a lot. I think the charge now is to learn how to listen better. And as we listen better, to adapt to the needs of our students, the needs of our changing world. Uh, just a briefly share with you about some of the collaborations uh, uh, in at Megar Evers College. You know, generally in the, in the school of business, we stay within ourselves and there's not a lot of cross uh, over uh, between disciplines, but we are now doing business science, uh, creating new businesses with science. And that is something we hadn't done before. We, as business people, uh, created business with other business folks. And now what we are realizing is we get stronger businesses. Remember I talked to you about that boot camp? Well, my strongest students in that boot camp were not my business students. My strongest students in that boot camp were the science and tech students. Why? Because they have been trained differently and they, they understood things differently. And all I had to do was give them a few extra uh, tips and, 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 and skill sets. So I will tell you about our my most proudest moment in, in this intercollaboration. Uh, our first year when we went to a competition within CUNY and within in the region with our students, they laughed at us because they had never seen our students compete. And we did not do well that first time. So this is why experiential learning and repeat learning is important. The second year, those students were mad. They may not have had some of the resources that the other students had, but they had grit, they had determination, and they had, we will do it. And uh, yes, you can kick us down, but we'll be back. The next year they came back and they took first, second and third place at the region and then they went to the state. But the story goes on. One of our students, our young lady students, uh, she we had our own competitions because we had funding for entrepreneurship. So the first place prize was $10,000, second place was uh, $5,000 and third place was a couple of thousand dollars. So she had won our internal uh, uh, business plan or business pitch competitions, right? So we went to the CUNY wide with all of the CUNY students and we competed. And in the 16 years that they had ran that competition, a woman had never run, had never won. We were the first to have a women, woman, a young lady to win that competition. And guess what? She wasn't even a business major. She had had psychology and uh, pre-med training, but she wanted business training. And this young lady today is running her own business successfully. And let me tell you something else. She had never taken a business course, but she had run her business successfully for a couple of years. And she came to me and she said, Dean, I want to go to uh, grad school. I want an MBA. Well, it's difficult to get a master's in business administration and you never had an undergraduate degree. So I went to my colleague. We have articulation agreements all over the place. And I said, she has the training. I delivered and documented the boot camp training that she had. I gave her a strong reference. She entered that MBA program successfully, and just this summer she graduated. That's the power of giving our students confidence in stepping outside of the classroom. She had never been in a class at Megar Evers.
She had never been in a business class, but this is someone in community building, we saw potential and, it, and it's our duty to go beyond of what just we see in front of us, though, but to help others. Now this chart is a chart that was presented by our advisor. And here is where we see all those factors coming together and developing for the community. Uh, we call it the Center for Entrepreneurship Opportunity. We have worked with others to help us develop this. We have presented this con concept in several uh, uh, international uh, conferences. And this is what it says. In order to have businesses, start a business to be successful, you can't just let them, so most, most businesses that start, they fail all over the world. The, the, the failure rate is high. So how do you incubate them? How do you keep them going long enough so that, that they can uh, they could be successful? So we start with public policy. That's why it's important to have someone in public, uh, public administration on your team. Advocacy, lobbying, forums, and research and advocacy, working together with public investments and resource partners uh, in the small business administration that we have here and all the other groups where a lot of times these the, from the demographics that I told you about they self-exclude we got to find a way to bring them back into the fold and then we have our academic partners we talk a lot about the academic partners you have seen that um, many of you are in the academy so that part I don't have to talk about but here I want to take a moment most of the wealth in the world is no longer in the public sector most of the wealth in the world is in private hands. And so you need private investment partners. You need the banks, venture capitalists, angel investors, retail crowdfunding, all of the philanthropy, uh, most of the, the, the top three uh, 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 richest men in the world. They are all practicing philanthropy. philanthropy. Why? Um, Many of them, and I will say Bill Gates, I will talk about Bill Gates uh, because uh, he has uh, done a collaboration with Warren Buffett. They understand that wealth needs to flow and it needs to flow to areas where it's not. Uh, and so they have built these foundations to help tackle some of these huge problems of health. Uh, 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 Gates was working on uh, issues of the Ebola long before we got this current pandemic. So th there are those who understand that even though they've accumulated this wealth, that it, 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 it does not behoove them in the worldwide economy to just uh, uh, hold on to it and not use it for the social good. So let's talk about nonprofit funding partners a little bit. Community Development and Financial and Economic Development Corporations and National Foundations, they are all prevalent. And if you watch the news now, ever since we had this social unrest, many of them are looking for ways to uh, <laughs> put their funds to work that are going to, that's going to help others in areas that have not been helped before. And so there's a worldwide concern that the social unrest could get worse and everybody, or at least mm -hmm. a, a, a good group of folks is looking at ways of what can we do what, as a humanity to, to re, re, resolve this problem of, of disparity, income and wealth disparity. And then there are in-kind resources Students learn by doing, so they need the internships, they need the uh, mentorship, uh, we need to do the market research so we can understand what's coming down the pike and on and on and on. So it is not, you know, uh, it is not just one industry, one group, it is a combination of all of us working together to produce and help support an ecosystem uh, that is going to be more successful of creating that future startup than we have been in uh, the current startup. And so and now with the few moments that I have left, I wanna talk a, a little bit about the conclusions on the future of teaching and learning in the new world. 
The pandemic is creating a new world for us. We already had trends. We already knew that disruption was going to come. We in the academy was expecting change. We, we were not doing the change ourselves. Uh, I will tell you some of the economists feel that the academy is just incapable of doing the transformation itself. And therefore, the factors of industry and the factors of students and the factors of the world changing will force us to change to produce what what we need in a new workforce it's not just about us it's about what is needed by the new world that is coming to pass how to develop new effective leaders we need new methods of teaching the stage on the stage is not going to be enough in the brand new world we need to find more ways of experiential learning, more ways of giving students uh, uh, the ability to do active learning and to learn by the example. And this is key, this is key. In the new uh, dynamic marketplace, the demands on the student is going to be very, very great. They must learn how to learn. I'll give you my own personal example. I, I, I My corporate career started in IBM and uh, upstate New York. And I will tell you, I, as I went through IBM, I came to the uh, echo stop. I, that's my five minute warning. So <laughs> I gave myself. Uh, my, my, when I was in IBM, I was in the application division, uh, the, the uh, software application division. And what I found in the software application division was that uh, at first, in 12 months, a new application would come out, then six months, then nine months, uh, then six months, then three months. And the compression time of applications and the need to have fresh knowledge kept compressing. Now that was over 20 years ago. Where we are now is that the pace is so fast. It is not good enough for a student to learn how to code. What the student needs to learn is how to code a new application quickly because that may change even faster. The old application language may go away in, 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 in six months and a new application may need to be developed. So, so the pace of learning is going to be increasing. Lifelong learning will not just be the mantra that many of us used to, it will be a way of life in the new economy. I guarantee you those of us who don't change and don't learn will find that the world will leave us behind. And we are not expected as an academy to do it alone by ourselves. We need to uh, we need to work with government and in academic partnerships and collaborations around the world to accelerate teaching and learning in this brand new world. And so I was able to race to, <laughs> uh, I, I wanna try and uh, exit out of my screen. Yeah, uh, I was able to uh, stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, race to the end of my presentation. Uh, I just wanted to leave just a little bit of time if, if, if you have any, any questions. I, and I apologize, I was racing. So I'm open. Yes, um, <coughs> well, uh, people are uh, welcome to ask uh, Professor uh, Joan Raul. Uh, if there is any question, please uh, go ahead. Uh, well, if not, I would like to ask you, when are you coming over to Chile again? <laughs> <laughs> I can ask you, when are you coming to Brooklyn again? You're due for a visit. <laughs> Well, uh, you see, uh, I said the pandemic is going to be over sometime in the near future, I hope. And therefore we will be able to, um, to have a beautiful time all together and uh, to meet personally and, uh, you know, to get some jokes and that kind of things. And to be happy, which is the most important issue in this life. Well, uh, as a conclusion, I think uh, what, uh, Mega Eva College is doing, and in particular, uh, the School of uh, Business, uh, where uh, Professor Joan Rowell is the dean, is uh, to increase happiness for the students, to take care of them carefully, 
And uh, to be honest, it's like a family. It's a real family. There is no authority there. People do respect themselves because they understand that uh, everybody is working for the other. So there is a very strong collaboration. And I have a college uh, to me, as far as I know, although I'm very, very old, older than Professor Raul, as he said, <laughs> a lot older. And uh, I think that that's the only way to make some progress. Uh, to take care of the student is the most important issue. And uh, some people do not understand. They believe that uh, uh, some other issues are more important. More important than, than ever is now is to take care of the, the people who are in need, who people who need our uh, resources or whatever we can give. If we don't have money, we can give them our moral support. We have to do something. But happiness is something that it comes from from ourselves, and uh, if you share some happiness to others, you make the world a lot better, with or without pandemic, with or without other things. And you stop wars and that kind of thing that uh, no one wants. So it has been a real pleasure, uh, Professor Raul. And uh, please, uh, uh, thank you very much indeed on behalf of everybody. This tape is going to be available very soon in YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn. And so uh, we have your presentation, which is going to be in full in LinkedIn as uh, all the other previous speaker. And I do, uh, I, I do acknowledge uh, <coughs> Professor Rami Brachbach, which is uh, complicated to say the same name, but uh, I'm trying. Uh, Professor Divagrata Data. Uh, Professor Joan Roll, and they have done a lot of work and support us <coughs> as a member of the organizing committee. So thank you very much indeed to everybody. And I do appreciate the time. And uh, well, we shall see in a uh, very, very, very soon. Thank you very much indeed and goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Good luck. Good luck. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. I cannot see you. Oh, no. <clears throat> no, it's uh, dark. Okay, I'm back. I think it is showing up back. How are you doing? No. No, it is showing. Now all, all I can see your name there, Prof. Rashmi. <laughs> 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 you are. <laughs> no. Are you now it is showing. Are you hiding from oh, me? I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, you're uh, good not to see me. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, uh, how's the situation in India at the moment in New Delhi? Oh. Now, now I, can now see I you. think you see me. Yes, now I see you. <laughs> oh, you can see me now. That's why, that's why. <laughs> so, uh, you, yeah, the situation is, there, is, is uh, going to be the right. Is not good. Fine? Pardon? Hmm? Say so not good in India. The weather? I say not good. Weather is good, but the pandemic situation is not good. Oh, what a pity one. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> well, uh, well, we need to carry on working and oh. make the situation a lot better for everybody, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, here it's not good either. Mm, everywhere uh, it is present. You know, I'm planning uh, uh, not just to go to Hollywood now, I'm planning to go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good. But the idea to travel around uh -huh. would be absolutely wonderful. 
And yeah. uh, how's the situation? Are you involved in many uh, webinars? Yeah. And what do you have the I next one? That, yeah. When tomorrow. Are you tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. You are going to talk about fractals, I think. Yeah. You see? Uh, please uh, yeah. do yeah. send me some of your presentation when you can, when you have the time, of course. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will. Because the idea, that uh, is, hmm. well, uh, you see, uh, I'm collecting all the presentation, I'm going to send you the, all the tapes and that kind of things. <laughs> and yeah. the idea, you see, would be uh, to produce a book at the end yeah, of all, sure. all of this. Yeah, 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 uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, have you had any time to look at the revised article, uh, your article? I have not received, I mailed you also. I have not received any mail. I got, um, please uh, resend me that. No? Well, I'm going to check again, but I was pretty yeah, sure yeah, yeah. that I had sent No, you, you sent that, uh, but only the reviewer comments are there. What I have to do, Miss, I don't have that article. Again, send that article and then I will go through with that. No? Right. Uh, okay, I'm going to do so. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Um, and what is the... I think I forget that. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing is there, only the comment is there. So I have to require the manuscript also. Yeah. So you see, I now I just remember the name of the article. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, how the family? How is Rahat and... Everyone uh, is good. And uh, Shivam, how are they doing? Shivam is doing well. That very lovely one. Well. Mm -hmm. uh, please do pass on to them my best regard and best wishes. Yeah, he is also saying hello to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I hope that uh, we shall meet all together soon. Yeah, very soon we should be. Uh, well, we need the, to take the pandemic and to invite the pandemic to leave us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it will Some, leave us soon. Something like, uh, would you be kind enough to leave me? This is what we need to tell the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. So I, soon I will send him to you. Right. Soon Pardon? I uh, soon I will send Shivam to you. And that would be lovely, lovely. <laughs> well, I hope that uh, tomorrow it will do uh, very fine and uh, that kind of things. I'm going to send you the tape of this uh, webinar as well and mm -hmm. uh, the material, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll do just the same with uh, Professor Data as well. Mm -hmm. So to keep all the material not in just one PC because something may go wrong. And so we have a backup. <laughs> uh -huh. and, um, uh, with me, you will get everything. <laughs> I have a backup of everything. <laughs> well, you know, Chivani, is an expert so, on computing. I'm a good in keeping the record. No? <laughs> You know, sometimes when I have problem, I say, well, I would like to have Chivan here to solve the problem, yeah. computing problem, which are... Mm -hmm. uh, well, but now you see, uh, we are learning more about this kind of platform because uh, we use uh, a different one from our lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, we use uh, Blackboard mm -hmm. and Collaborate and Classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, do you lecture, what kind of uh, platform do you use? In your yes. lectures, which, university lectures. Uh, which kind of platform do you use when you lecture? Uh, normally Zoom. So Zoom has a Blackboard facility. Ah, uh, the same. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. very good, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you can write down that, no? Um, and in mathematics, you required uh, to write down a lot and to well, solve the problems. No? You see, in my case, I'm using this uh, Collaborate. Uh -huh. And you know, I share the screen with uh, the words. And uh, uh -huh. I have an, an special uh, editing for equation. So uh -huh. I, can, I can do everything. Um, it's just uh, a lecture. Uh -huh. uh, it's just like being in the classroom. 
Uh -huh. Because you see, I have to de de derive the equation on the spot in, on, in real time. Uh -huh. So <laughs> this is what we're, we're doing the best we can. The uh -huh. only thing I don't know how to do is how to draw in a program. So you know what I do? I draw in a piece of paper, I take a picture, uh -huh. and I send the picture to the student. <laughs> <laughs> I am not very good I at think, that. Uh, I think you can use uh, that software. Which one? Um, for drawing of that chemical draw or something is there, no? No, in my case, you see, uh, what I'm doing at the moment, I'm, I'm teaching them uh, group theory for molecules and it's a solid state physics. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I have to do uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a, Equation, okay, metric, yeah. notation, that oh, kind of oh, thing. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is a, it's a bit more complex than um, just uh, to talk, actually. Hard to write down the equations, no, it is. And you have to do it um, in real time. That is the, the, the thing. So you cannot <laughs> make a mistake. <laughs> For instance, two plus two is equal to four. <laughs> hey, yeah, it is good now. So well, we are uh, learning. What, if, uh, what is the status of our journal, Inglomayor? Inglomayor is. Have, uh, you gone there? Have you gone through with that agreement? Yes, uh, that is uh, it's almost ready. Uh, there are the two things we required it. Uh, uh miss a quarter uh it will be four issues or two issues in a year uh i think that is something that uh, i was uh, planning to i am going to Hello. write to you because mm -hmm. i think it's good uh, it would be better to have uh, two issues for per year uh, because uh, if we required a four then they will uh, hook up us at uh, like for the march issue they will hook up us at uh, january Yes, so that we, uh, so, uh, so we required, uh, let me write uh, to you about the, 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 the agreement. Uh, uh, because with, uh, whatever yellow highlighted, na, that I have changed. Yes, and I'm going you, to, to write to you and let you know, and uh, both of us we will take the decision, the final one. Uh, the the final one, one, then we will share with them. No? Yes, what we are going to do actually, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there are some people uh, joining us a bit late actually, but uh, it's not bad. Uh, we have uh, Andres. Hello, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Hello. 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 Yes. This Hello. Is uh, this is Professor Rashmi, Andres. Hi. Uh, she's a distinguished scientist. Hi. Hello. India. Hello. And we have Philippe Kanye. It's nice she's... to meet you. Uh, same here. I'm not able to see you. <laughs> and we also have Felipe <laughs> Felipe Kanye. Andres, uh, you can share the screen. How do you activate your camera, Andres? Uh, yes. Uh... Now he's going to. Uh, I have a, a pyjama now. He's <laughs> in pyjama. I, I am wearing. Uh, uh, yes. Well, it that's it's not going yeah. to make much difference. But uh, 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 a little more. <laughs> and this is uh, uh, Felipe Caña. He's uh, a student. Mm -hmm. He's just, uh, just about to finish his, uh, his study in uh, civil engineering mining, uh, Felipe Cañas, oh, okay. he's over there. Yeah. And he's a very good student. Hello, hello. Hello. I see? am Andres. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Rashmi here. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then was sleeping. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, um, well, uh, well uh, uh, Rashmi, I'm going to write to you then for Inglo Mayor, okay? Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, please uh, do say hello to uh, Chiban and Rahat and to everybody, eh? in particular your, yeah, your yeah, parents. Yeah. How are they doing, yeah. your parents? How are they doing? Not good, I told you earlier. Oh, my goodness, I have to pray for um, them. Uh, well, tell them to be strong. I want to meet both yeah, of them. Yeah, they are strong enough, but uh, age factor is there. My goodness, well. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, do take care. Yeah, you too. Uh, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks. Gracias, Andrés. Puedes eh, <laughs> estar tranquilo. Gracias, Felipe, eh, por eh, haberte eh, incorporado. ¿De acuerdo? Sí. Y... Cuídese, profe, eh, porque el, parece que, que hay de nuevo contagios de COVID en Santiago, para que no se... No sé. No salgo. Entusiasmen mucho. No pónganse medidas de protección. No se descuiden. ¿ya? Por el, ahí Brenda me contaba que le tocó atender unas personas. Ya. ya eh. Ok. Ya. Uh, bueno, que hoy tengo un desastre eso. ¿eh? Bueno, quiero Dios que nos siga esto. Po. Bueno, cuídense harto. Eh, Felipe, gracias. Y bueno, en todo caso les voy a mandar la, la grabación ¿eh? para que la vean. ¿Les parece? ¿Aló? Super profe, si me la envía para mí es muy bueno. Sí, que yo... sí fue difícil mandar. hoy. ¿eh? Felipe, okay. ¿tú me escuchas, Felipe? Hola, profe, sí, sí lo escucho. Ya, mi hijito, les voy a mandar la grabación, ¿ya? Ya, profe, muchas gracias. Oye, muy amable, mijito. Gracias. Chao. Chao, chao. Cariño en la casa. Chao, mijo.